Okay, we're going to learn a little bit about guacamole today. And what is guacamole? Well, guacamole is um, a clientless remote desktop gateway. That's probably the best way to kind of describe it. It allows you to access remote systems via the VNC protocol, the remote desktop protocol, and also SSH. Guacamole provides connections to desktops and console terminals with these protocols via a web browser in the HTML5 protocol. In an environment with a large number of desktop and or server instances, Guacamole provides a single point of management. In my case, it works out really well because at this point in my home lab, I probably have 45 or so uh, terminals and so, uh, or, or I should say instances that I can log into and configure for various services, both internal and external. And it grows as, as you've been uh, creating more self-hosted applications. Guacamole is free and open source. So why use guacamole? Guacamole provides a means for remote access to systems. So that's probably the biggest reason to be able to remotely access your systems. It has the ability to group systems and also to create user accounts with specific privileges. So you might have one user that can be an administrator of the guacamole system, whereas you may have another person that's more of a user level person and they may only have access to a few particular uh, systems. It can store profiles with usernames and passwords as well as SSH keys. It's secure, it uses SSL, and it also uses two-factor authentication, which is a good thing, especially if you're providing access to systems. We want that access to be secure access. And Guacamole lets you connect to a system remotely and securely without a VPN in a web browser instance. So uh, a lot of... Um, a lot of connectivity ways to do this would be coming in from the outside via VPN, which is extremely secure and it's great, but it gains access to the entire network. With Guacamole, you can expose just one particular system or maybe a system on a VLAN. So that comes in handy. And Guacamole can be used as a virtual desktop interface, otherwise known as VDI, for users to access home lab or data center hosted desktops, which is pretty nice. I mean, uh, so what are the features? Guacamole provides a mean for remote, means for remote access to systems. Well, we know that. It, uh, it also tracks an audit trail of who's been connected and to which systems and actually for how long. It optionally supports an on-screen keyboard for special character input, <clears throat> or it can also be used on a tablet. And it has a dashboard for administrators to monitor active sessions. Administrators can set connect limits to any system or even connect limits per user, or you can even set a particular system that they're only allowed to connect to that system during particular hours. Guacamole supports connecting through a proxy server if you require that in your uh, system. And then even more guacamole features. It comes with chips. No, I guess not. There are a lot of customizable options for terminal display, font, color, and size, as well as scroll back memory. So, I mean, the, the point to bring up here is that you can connect to a console of a system, meaning a terminal, but you can also connect up to the full GUI of the operating system. And so this addresses if you connect to the terminal, um, that you can customize that terminal having different font, color, size, um, and such. And, and these um, uh, 
these terminals are just web pages, just like uh, any other web page tab. The clipboard can be enabled or disabled uh, per the admin that created the connection. Um, session and screen recording are also report are also supported, so you can have a session uh, recorded automatically or on demand. And file transfer via secure FTP is also supported, which is kind of nice. Wake on LAN is supported as well, so it's possible to have on a Wake on LAN network if you have um, a Wake on LAN supported network and you have Wake on LAN supported adapters configured properly, you can power up a remote system um, that may be down uh, and then connect to it with Guacamole. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about how to install the product. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but it's really simple. So um, typically I like to go with something like um, um, a later release Debian or uh, Ubuntu Server 18.04 or 20.04. And I pick the server versions because uh, we wanna have, um, uh, you know, our hosted applications being kind of lean and mean, and we don't really need a desktop. So bottom line, you know, pick the server version of these apps because that always works best. So this is the entire installation procedure. Basically, you install um, software properties common, uh, this script that you go out and get with the wget command um, really performs everything that's needed. Um, you change uh, the uh, script after you download it to have executable privilege because otherwise it won't run without execute privilege when you download it. And then you invoke the script. And after you invoke the script, you go to the web interface and the web interface has a username of guac admin and a password of guac admin. So what does that look like? Let's go install guacamole. Well, first of all, um, I had an instance out there. My instance could have been a virtual machine. It could have been uh, a separate piece of hardware. In this particular case, uh, I'm connecting to something in my home lab um, at 172.16.1.187, and that something happens to be a LexC instance of Ubuntu server. So uh, it, since it's the first time I ever connect to it, of course, it asks you whether or not um, um, it can store a new fingerprint for that. A fingerprint basically amounts to a combination of um, the IP address and MAC address. It is a protection that SSH has to make sure you're not connecting to something that perhaps might be being spoofed out there. So I provide my password and I log in and you can see that this instance is Ubuntu 2004.3. So now we're gonna install the dependencies. There's the sudo apt-get install software properties common. Uh, I control C out of that because my instance already had that in there. And then I do the wget uh, for the script and it downloads the script. So that's what's on that page. And then finally, I run the install script. Well, first of all, I've got to change the protection to have executable protection on the script before I can run it. We mentioned that earlier. And then I'm going to invoke the script. So when you invoke the script, um, first of all, uh, it's going to come back and say, hey, you've got to run this as the sudo user because it's going to install some privileged components and we need to do that. So I invoked it the first time, got the error message, invoked it the second time with sudo. First question is, would you like to install TOTP? So TOTP is uh, time-based one-time passwords. It's a, uh, it's a way of having two-factor authentication. Since you're providing access to your systems that could potentially be from outside your network, I highly, highly recommend that the answer to this question be yes. Um, the next question you're going to have is, it uh, is going to install MySQL. Um, go ahead and say yes, go ahead and install MySQL. Um, <clears throat> you uh, have to make up a root password for MySQL. It can be anything you want. The installation will deal with that password on down the road. And it'll create a new user called Guacamole user for the database. And then... Uh, 
after that, it will run on for quite a while. Uh, probably about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, the speed of your system does matter. And towards the end of it, it'll have started everything up. It'll have created the Guacamole uh, GuacD service, which is the web service for the application, cleans up its files. And then down here at the bottom, you say it, it says visit HTTP colon slash slash localhost colon 8000 guacamole. So that's really important because it's whatever address that you specified when you did the installation and then port 8080 because that's the default port that they create the service on. And then uh, if you just go to port 8080, it'll come up and say it's installed properly, but it won't actually give you a login screen. You'll have to say slash guacamole at the end of that. And it reminds you again that guac admin is the username and guac admin is the password. So here I am signed on and my local uh, address, as you remember from earlier, was 172.16.1.187 port 8080 and guacamole. And here I've got my username and my password, which I've typed in guac admin and guac admin. And that logs me in from the web browser. Remember that we said we wanted time-based one-time passwords, TOTP. This is our two-factor authentication. And so it comes up with this screen. Um, you can uh, use something like Google Authenticator and scan the uh, QR code, or you can go ahead and click on Show Details, and it'll give you the long string of characters to enter into some other type of two-factor authentication to do its setup. Anyway, once you've completed two-factor authentication setup, the very next screen you run into is the main screen. So the main screen is a little bit austere, uh, not much to it. And in fact, nothing to it right now because it doesn't say there are any recent connections because we haven't connected anything. And the only thing you really see is in the upper right-hand corner, you see Guac Admin. And that's actually a drop-down menu. So user settings. You want to click on that menu we just pointed out where it says Guac Admin. You want to change to the settings screen. So that menu's got a couple of options on it. It's got the uh, um, username at the top before you click on it. It's got home, which is where we started, and it's got settings, and it's basically got log out. <laughs> so you want to go to uh, users once you're in the settings screen, and you want to add a username for yourself. And be sure to make yourself an administrator. So what does that look like? All right, I know this is a little bit microfilmed here, so you might want to be looking at it on a display, um, but there's a zillion options. The important ones are when you create this new user, I created a user, Scott. You want to enter the password. And of course, it says re-enter password again. Um, the profile section, you don't really have to fill anything in, but <clears throat> it's got you know full name, uh, email address, organization, and role. So whatever your needs are, you can fill that in to... to uh, meet those requirements. And then under account restriction, uh, you can disable the account. Well, we don't want to do that. We're creating it right now. Um, you can set it to where the password is pre-expired if you want, so where you give them a first password and then you force them to change it. Uh, you can limit their access times, uh, not after a certain time period. Um, and you can also enable the account after a date, and you can also disable it after a particular date. So you can have a time-bounded account, um, maybe if you've got a vendor coming in to look at something. And then the important thing is, in this case, since I'm creating this for myself, uh, I want to have the administer system checkbox checked. But you can see there's a granularity of a lot of different permissions that you can optionally have created here as well. So now we got to you got to complete your user registration. You're going to log back out and you're going to log back in under the username you just created. In my case, I'm going to log back in under Scott. And it's going to require my two-factor authentication for this account. So again, I'm going to have to go set that up like we did when we logged into the Guac admin account. Once that's completed, go out and delete the Guac admin account because you don't need it anymore. And plus, uh, it's pretty guessable because when you install it, the username is Guac Admin. So create your own user account. 
Now that I'm logged into my user account and I'm on this users menu we were just talking about, you can see the only user left is Scott. And uh, that's basically it. So now you want to create your first connection. You're going to go to the settings menu and on the settings menu is a connections uh, across the top and you want to click new connection. When you click new connection, it will get into a screen that says edit connection. You want to give this thing a name. Well, I'm using guacamole to get into guacamole. If I had thought about it, I would have created a system called chips and then I could have used guacamole to get into the chips. Oh well, so much for that. Anyway, um, location is root. So what does that mean? Well, you can create groups in guacamole. You can have system uh, groups of systems. Like you might have terminals and you might have GUIs or you might have, um, you know, uh, I don't know, development systems, production systems, whatever. So you can create groups and assuming that you may have, you know, 40 or 50 of these definitions, groups are just like folders that help you um, categorize them, make them a little easier to find. And then um, down here, protocol. Well, in this particular case, I said that Guacamole server um, is actually just a server, so it doesn't have a GUI. So my really only option was to connect via SSH protocol. And I'm kind of focusing on SSH for this, um, this uh, tutorial. And the reason for that is because um, I want to provide a system that can gain access to as many of our other systems out there. And if you're self-hosting, you're SSHing into things all the time, you're having to remember their addresses, you're having to remember their usernames, you're having to remember their passwords, all that kind of stuff. So anyway, we're gonna go create a new connection. Um, you don't need any of these other things, but it's it's noteworthy that they do have things like you can set concurrency limits per user, maximum number of connections to the server, um, you, it, it even supports load balancing. Uh, it, I mentioned earlier that they have support for proxy parameters, so that's kind of neat. And then at the bottom, you really are going to need this. You're going to need the host name. So if you have a local DNS, you can put the local DNS name in there. In this particular case, I'm just hard coding the address 172.16.1.187. Um, yours is going to vary. And uh, port 22, because port 22 is the default port for SSH, unless your server is offering SSH on a different port. Um, going down the page, and it, and it will, uh, it's just a long vertical page. I did some screen snapshots here so we could see things a little bit better. Um, the next section you're going to have after the network parameters is you're going to have authentication parameters. So in this case, my username on the guacamole server itself, not to be confused with the guacamole website that we created with the guacamole app, but the actual just server, its username is Scott and it has a password, okay? And then we have a capability for private key later. We'll talk about that um, later on in the, in the presentation. And then just for fun, I decided to make this a really retro looking terminal. Um, there's a neat drop down here, but I changed my color screen, screen, my color scheme to green on black. And I think that's really uh, pretty awesome. And then you can enable or disable the clipboard. By default, it's enabled and that's pretty handy. Uh, you got things like, uh, uh, you can have um, other things that apply to the session environment, other things that apply to some of the terminal commands. Uh, you can actually have some scripts. So it's pretty flexible. I haven't used all these options. Uh, don't really need them. Uh, the next section after that is screen recording. You can set up a screen recording path and a screen recording name. And then the person in the guacamole section session uh, can either be having their um, session recorded automatically, or I think they can record on demand. Um, the next thing is you can enable the SFTP server, and that way you can transfer files from your system into the system you're connected to. And finally, we got Wake on LAN. So at the very bottom, when you do all that stuff and scroll, 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 or in this case, we just have the scrolling uh, screenshot side by side, you're going to click Save. And once you click Save, you're going to have your new 
connection profile completed. So the settings screen and the home screen. This is an important distinction. First time I used this program, uh, it confused me a bit. Um, <clears throat> in the upper right hand corner, you see uh, we don't have Guaco admin anymore. We've got Scott because we're logged into the Scott account. Well, when you go to that drop down, when you first log in, you're going to be on the home screen. And I went to that drop down and I went to the settings screen. And that's how I created my connection. And I've got this one connection called guacamole. And by the way, it uses a little caret sign with an underscore because it kind of looks like a terminal prompt. And they're trying to say, well, this is a terminal as opposed to being a GUI, which would be a screen. So if you created like uh, an RDP connection to a Windows machine, um, then what you'd see is you'd see a little screen telling you that that's, uh, that's more of a GUI. Anyway, this is the setting screen. Here's where the confusion comes in. This screen down here is the home screen. The home screen is where you connect on, connect to systems on. So on the settings screen, if you click on, gua, click on guacamole, what you're doing is you're getting into the guacamole profile to edit it. On the home screen, if you click on guacamole, you're connecting to it. And it's just important to remember which screen you're on. By default, you're in the home screen unless you've gone to the settings screen. So once we click on guacamole in the home screen, we the screen that we're in there that you just saw, uh, that web browser tab immediately goes over to a connection to the terminal. So I clicked on it and then I got my green on black background. We connected to my guacamole demo um, uh, server that's located at 172.16.1.187 with the username and password I put in. And there we are logged in. I did a LSAL just to, just to do a, a, a folder here. And that's all there is to it. And then if you type exit that you normally would to log out of an SSH session, it'll go ahead and return you. And when it returns you, it will uh, come back with a pop-up that says you've been disconnected because we typed exit. And uh, they, they will give you three buttons. One is a home button, one is a reconnect, one's a logout. Home goes back to the home screen that we saw. The first one, not the settings screen. The second is the reconnect. Well, the reconnect gives you the ability to just go right back in because I didn't mean to log off. Log out means really log out of guacamole completely, in which case you need to come back in with your username and password for the guacamole web page, and you'd have to provide your 2FA credentials. So we have a lot of protection front-ending this because as you can see, once you're in here, you're in here. So um, the thing is, is right now my configuration of guacamole is local configuration. Assuming you have a domain name and assuming you have a uh, uh, Nginx proxy manager out there, which I talked about in my last video, um, then you can set up a, an Nginx definition for Guacamole. So Guacamole is a little bit different than a typical service, uh, and we want to define Guacamole in Nginx proxy manager. So when we say add proxy host, we're going to go out and name it. In my case, I named mine guacamole.scottabyte.com. Uh, say it's HTTP because the server itself is HTTP. It's not HTTPS. And then uh, my server, my production servers inside my network on a private NAT address, which has nothing to do with the internet at 172.16.1.15. And the forward port, remember when we worked with the web server, uh, and we went into the web page, we had to specify port 8080, and that's why we're specifying port 8080 here. And I've got web sockets, support turned on, and block common exploits because those are best practices. Then, if you move over to the custom locations tab, the second tab at the top, you'll want to go in there and uh, add a location. And the location is going to be forward slash. 
And then the scheme is exactly the same that we put on the previous page with the exception that we're going to put the address forward slash guacamole forward slash at the end and the same port number. So the reason for this, uh, oh yeah, and by the way, third screen, <laughs> we go over to the SSL tab, we're going to request a new SSL certificate. After we request it, we're going to come back in and we're going to click force SSL. So what this is going to do is instead of having to remember port 8080 and instead of having to remember forward slash guacamole, we're just going to be able to type in guacamole.scottabyte.com and it's going to go into the server, prompt me for a username, a password, and my 2FA key so I don't have to worry about that port number and I don't have to worry about the guacamole. So that's what this entry does here. Okay, so I got a bonus here, and that's defining SSH keys. We mentioned SSH keys a little bit earlier. SSH key pairs, which aren't really directly uh, related to guacamole, but it's something that you should know about in connection with guacamole. SSH key pairs can be used in lieu of a password on a server. And we'll talk about why we might want to do that here in a little bit. A login with keys can limit authentication from only systems that have the keys, as opposed to a username and password. Anybody that has a username and password can log in. Whereas if you use the keys, only the people with the keys can log in. So here's an example of how you set up keys. And, and this doesn't apply to guacamole again, but I, I did it on the guacamole server just so you could see how it works. So you'd log into your Linux account, uh, wherever it happens to be. This could be your desktop machine, server, whatever. Uh, presumably you'd want to do this on your desktop machine, though, because you're going to set up the ability to use the keys. And you're going to make a hidden directory called SSH. So in, in Linux, anything that is preceded by a period is a, is a hidden directory. So you're going to do a make dir.ssh from your home directory. So right inside your home directory is this SSH uh, subfolder. And then we're gonna do a chmod of 0700 on .ssh. What that does is it, it turns off uh, directory access for everybody. It provides uh, user access, full user access to this directory, and then no access for groups or other. And that basically secures the directory. Since we're going to put um, secure keys in here, we want the directory secure. Makes sense. And then you're going to generate yourself some keys. You're going to do an ssh-keygen space dash t space rsa. So rsa is the most common type of security key that's used today. And by default, it creates 2048 byte keys. And so I'm saying... Uh, the byte number should be 4096. So I'm, I'm building a bigger key, a 4096 byte key. The bigger, the better, more secure, right? So it says generating public keys, um, public private key, uh, key pair via RSA. And it says enter the file in which to save the key. Well, I, I just put nothing in, in which case it's going to create a file called ID under, under bar RSA, which is fine. And then you can optionally add a password or passphrase to the key, which I'm, I, I keep my keys secure, so I don't really need a passphrase, but it's a passphrase, but it's an extra level of security. So I did not do that. And then it says your keys have been saved in uh, slash home slash Scott slash dot SSH and then um, ID under bar RSA uh, and ID under bar rsa.pub. So the first one is my private key. The second one is my public key. And then it says the key fingerprint is this blah, de, blah, de, blah, de, blah. And, you know, it gives you this little uh, uh, picture here that's not helpful for much else other than to say that it generated the key. <laughs> so that's how that works. All right. How do we use these keys? What do we do with them? So you want to copy your public key to a target server and test it. How do we do that? Well, there's a command called ssh-copy-id. 
you're going to be your username at sign the target system. Okay. So in this case, I'm sitting on my desktop computer. Its name is Mondo. Uh, I didn't do the previous screen uh, where I generated the keys on my machine because I already have keys on my machine. So anyway, I'm going to go SSH copy ID. When you do that, it's going to come up and prompt for your password, okay? Because it's going to assume you have a username and password on the other system. A prerequisite of being able to put keys on the other system is you have access to the other system. And it proves you have access to the other system if you entered the correct password. So if we do that, then it goes ahead and says it's copying uh, a key over there. And then it will tell you, hey, try logging into the machine with SSH, in my case, Scott, at that address. And so I did that. And you notice I didn't have to provide a password, nor was I prompted. It just says, welcome to Ubuntu 2004.3, and I get a username prompt. So that's what SSH keys do for you. They automate the login, but they also restrict the login to the people that have the keys. So at this point, you can log in with either the keys or with a password. So um, provided you've tested your keys... Uh, in cases where you want to have extreme login security, a really good example of that might be if you had a uh, maybe a cloud server, maybe a server through AWS or DigitalOcean or Linode. Um, you'd want to have SSH key access, but you'd probably want to also turn off password login. So um, before you do that, you got to make sure your SSH keys work. We did that on the previous screen because we SSH'd in. We didn't ever have to provide a password and we got in. So that's goodness. So the password is still needed, though, uh, for sudo commands. So once you log into the server, if it asks for a sudo command for privileged access to something you're doing, you still need the password. But... It, it, it provides that level of security getting into the server at all. On the system where you want to disable the password login, you just do a sudo nano uh, forward slash Etsy forward slash SSH forward slash SSHD underbar config. So that's the SSH uh, daemon configuration file. And you're going to search for something that says password authentication in that file because it's got hundred lines or something and uh, you set password authentication to no and once you do that uh, you can never use a password for login password still works when you're on the system for things like sudo commands but you're limited to having to use the keys in order to log in so you're going to save the file and you're going to restart ssh how do you restart ssh you do a sudo System CTL restart SSH. Okay, so that previous screen was was an was an option. You didn't really need to do that. You didn't need to to, to disable your passwords. I like SSH keys just because they make getting in easier. But that's how you can make them really secure. So um, the reason I mention SSH keys is because you remember earlier on. Uh, there was an option in Guacamole to use SSH keys. So how do we use them in Guacamole? Well, a benefit to using your SSH key in Guacamole is that the Guacamole connection will still work even if the end user changes the password on the system. So remember the Guacamole profile we first set up had a hard-coded password in it. Well, if instead of having a hard-coded password, if it had a uh, if it had an SSH key in it, um, even if the user changed the password, um, which would be their pseudo password in essence, um, or it could be user password that you'd have out there for them, um, it would still be able to log in because of the SSH keys. So this is how you do that. Remember when we were creating the um, account for our mock guacamole um, system. It could have been any system. It was just a system we were connecting to. The console was at 172.16.1.187. It was port number 22. And we had a password in here. Well, I cleared the password out. And instead, 
I copied that private key. The private key has begin RSA private key, and then it has a whole bunch of stuff. In this case, 4,096 bytes, because that's how big we told it to be. And away at the end, it has this thing that says end private key. So um, that went ahead and saved the, the uh, private key off there. I saved this setup. And now um, this... Uh, guacamole session is using an SSH key to sign in instead of otherwise. And the guacamole user has no idea how it's being authenticated because they're just seeing a dollar sign prompt after they log in and that's it. So that's pretty neat. So the private key comes from the ID under bar RSA file in the .ssh folder of my Scott account or in the .ssh folder of whatever your account is. We've copied the contents of that key. We catted it so we could list it out and we just pasted it in here. That's all we did to set that up. All right. So Guacamole supports remote connections to both terminals and full operating system GUI interfaces in an HTML, HTML5 web browser tab instance. That's pretty powerful. I didn't show off uh, connecting via RDP because it's pretty self-explanatory. You do the same, same sort of thing. Guacamole supports full GUI connections via RDP and VNC. So you can use both protocols for your GUIs. Guacamole can be used to provide virtual desktop interface, VDI service, by connecting to back-end systems. So we got a, uh, you know, uh, multiple systems out there, and we want to provide them as a service to somebody on our network, or maybe even somebody off network, since we now have our, our Guacamole publicly available through Nginx Reverse Proxy Manager. Um, they provide their username to Guacamole, they provide their password to Guacamole, and they provide their time-based one-time password uh, two-factor authentication key. They're logged in, and then whatever systems we've decided to allow them to see via their user account, they'll be able to see and connect to. So Guacamole is secure, and it provides two-factor authentication, as I've already mentioned, and that time-based one-time passwords uh, and, and those can be through something like Google Authenticator, which is probably the most common thing that people use, or they can be through Bitwarden. And Bitwarden is, is, is a really good way to do it as well. Bitwarden's an open source password manager. Um, you can go to Awesome Open Source and check one of Brian's uh, videos on the installation of Bitwarden, and he explains it really nicely. I highly encourage Bitwarden. Um, Complex passwords and two-factor authentication are the only ways to secure your systems. Well, along with SSH keys. So Guacamole is also used by large organizations, large companies, because it's scalable and it provides a full audit trail and history records for logins and connections to any systems that you have out there. So it makes it a really nice product. In a home lab, it just kind of keeps all your ducks in a row. You don't end up forgetting, well, where was that system? What address did I put it at? What was the username? What was the password? Guacamole tracks all that for you so you can log into it. Anyway, thanks for now. I hope this was helpful to the group. Um, if you like the content, you'd like to see some more on down the road, uh, please subscribe and like, and we will be talking again soon. Thank you.